and welcome to another episode of Radio Warnerd. Uh, the date today is October 28th, 2017, and this is episode 107. I'm the co-host Mark Ames. I'm coming to you from Telescope Audio Studios in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and I'm on the line with the Warnerd, Gary Brecher, a.k.a. John Dolan, in Kuala Lumpur. You're still there. How is it out there? It's a great city. Uh, we love this place. I mean, uh, there's there's a sense you get in, in a lot of Southeast Asian cities uh, that uh, there's no problem. You know, I mean, people are going about their business. Nobody cares one way or the other. They're just uh, doing their jobs and people will help you within reason, but you're not an object of much interest or much hostility or much anything else. You're just part of the landscape. And that's a really comforting feeling. Uh, and the city has changed a lot. I mean, you know, Mark, you and I were here in, in the 90s, and uh, it felt absurdly congested. I mean, I, I remember one time we were downtown in the afternoon and wanted to go back to the outskirts where we were staying, and the taxis just laughed in our faces and said, uh, we're oh, you're right. crazy. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's a mass transit system here now. The, there's a train from the airport that takes you in, as they say, air-conditioned comfort right to the center of town. Um, and there's, a, there's this amazing temple to the sea goddess on the hillside opposite our apartment. Oh, yeah. I don't even know why there's a temple to the sea goddess because Kuala Lumpur is uh, it, apparently it literally means muddy river junction and it's <laughs> well inland. Um, but uh, there are a lot of uh, immigrants from Hainan, that island off South China, and mm. it somehow was important to them to build this six level temple to their sea goddess. And at night uh, for some festival, I'm not quite sure of which, they suspended a giant white balloon above the temple so it looked like some surrealist painting of a street light that was the size of a gigantic balloon hanging over the temple uh i don't know why but that too is part of the pleasure of being in a southeast asian city a lot of wonderful things go on and you look at them and you don't really know what's happening mm. and that in itself is a pleasure yeah yeah, I missed, definitely missed all that when you and I visited there a little over 20 years ago. Um, wasn't paying attention, you know, just no. had, had my eye on other priorities other priorities, and getting up, yeah, up north. Um, and that's, that was a shame. Plus, we were in a kind of strange situation, staying with a friend way out and their family way out in the boondogs, as you said, in a big house, as I recall. Yeah. servants and I mean they were very they were living like like oligarchs practically it was pretty strange yeah yeah, yeah. servants are, are frightening yeah uh, you're not used to the idea and, and that it was part of this sort of uh, jaded expat clique that was uh, pretty tedious to be around too mm -hmm. right so um, so we're going to talk about your excellent War Nerds the Iliad, or Rage, as you call it as well, and we'll talk about why you call it Rage. We're going to talk about the whole book, actually. I've noticed that, first of all, I noticed that um, uh, there seems to be, a, it's, the sales have got to be good, because I keep seeing people posting, you know, I got the book with a photo of it and saying how much they're enjoying it. Uh, I see it on Facebook and on Twitter, and um, and I check, because, you know, you, you had asked people if, possible just because of the way that the marketing world works i guess you know could you please help by posting a review on um on amazon or what's the other one good books or something good like, reads good reads right and and so i checked over at uh amazon you i mean there's like i don't know 40 or 50 reviews and as far as yeah, i can tell they're and, all good and uh a lot of them are from uh subscribers or people who know me from facebook and i want to say thanks very much for doing that so it seems uh, satisfied customers always a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm. Where do we start? I mean, first of all, let's start with before we even get into the introduction in the book. Um, what what made you want to to rewrite the Iliad? Um, and who do you think you are? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
a cat can look at an Iliad, as the <laughs> saying goes. Um, well, I mean, this goes way back for me. It's, uh, one of the reasons it came into being is our mutual friend, Jan Frell, mm. uh, suggested it. And who do you think you are is, is the question that went through my mind when he uh, said that. I thought, who, who am I to redo the Iliad? But then it occurred to me, the Iliad was the book that my mother used to teach me to read. It was by far the most important book uh, of my early childhood. And uh, I had a child's version, obviously, but a, a beautiful child's version that was about, I don't know, almost um, half a meter high, hardbound, with uh, beautiful illustrations that were done in a uh, by this, I think, Polish husband and wife team based on uh, the uh, vase painting style mm. of uh, portraits of Greek warfare. And they did it in watercolor, really beautiful. And the story was just stripped down in simple prose, uh, and it made instant sense to me. Uh, hmm. And then it was kind of a shock to leave that sort of stewing in my head for a long time and then become a gullible undergraduate and be subjected to the uh, popular, well, not popular at all, the uh, required versions of the Iliad. And uh, they were unreadable. Mm -hmm. um, they, I, in fact, I don't know anybody who has managed to make it through a full-length poetic version of the Iliad in English unless they were absolutely required to do so for a degree program. Mm -hmm. And that seems odd because it's a great story. And I first met it as a great story. And I started looking into Jan's idea. Yeah. And I was scared at first. I thought, this is presumptuous. This is wrong. This will extend my time in purgatory. <laughs> but um, the, the more I thought about it and the more I looked at these other translations, the more I, I thought the Iliad has been given over to the classicist guild. And first of all, I know that guild, and it's not a very good guild. It really isn't. Uh, it's, maybe, maybe it was a good guild in Germany in 1880, but it's not a very good guild in the Anglosphere in the early 21st century. And uh, it, what it mainly wants to do is protect this text and keep it away from people. So that and means keeping it obscure, like so much obscure. of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is they're doing that by being rigorous, by retaining mm. uh, the original poetics. And that would be a laudable goal if it was being done or even, even could be done. But it doesn't work that way. I mean, the, I don't want to bore people to death, but you know, you and I both went through a, a poetry training phase where you do close analysis like in rhetoric 32 or whatever mm -hmm. of the prosody the music of, of each line mm -hmm. and we did those little uh u shapes and those little stress marks meaning uh stressed and unstressed syllables well that's supposed to be applied to the original poetics of the iliad but it does not work because english has stressed and unstressed syllables but the language in which this was written has long and short vowels, and those are very important. English mm. does not have those things. The mm. reason I know what what they mean is is because even though I don't speak Arabic, I did at least study Arabic at one time, and Arabic is the language that has the same prosody, long and short vowels. Mm. Uh, and you and you can hear it. The, the the long vowel term is harakat tawila. Mm. And you can hear the harakat, that's a, that's a long vowel at the end. And tawila, that's a long vowel. Uh, there's a difference between ha, the short vowel, and kat, the long vowel. English does not have that. You can't do that. Um, Arabic, maybe you could translate the Iliad's original prosody into Arabic, because it does have that. But you can't do it into English. The idea that you can substitute stressed and unstressed syllables, which English does have, into uh, the long and short vowels of ancient Greek is just fanciful. Um, and yet it's been presented as a kind of pseudo-rigor. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the original 
of the Iliad was supposedly in dactylic hexameter, that is really long lines. And, and the, the only English poem uh, that has supposedly managed to capture that is Evangeline, which is a, a very long, very boring uh, book length poem. And, and here's a line that tries to do dactylic hexameter in English. This is the forest, how does it go? This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. This is the forest primeval, and then a pause in the middle of the line, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. And if you think I'm going to write a book length <laughs> thing trying to capture that ridiculous meter mm. in every line. I mean, I couldn't do it. I, I, I have a sensitive ear here. It would <laughs> kill me. And more to the point, nobody would ever read it. Yeah. Who would read a book of that? I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. So I flipped it and just thought, well, you know, I started as a poet too. And I'm not sure even that poetry exists in contemporary English. Um, and what I found is that when I took everything I'd learned from poetry and put it into paragraphs in this memoir I wrote called Pleasant Hell, people would read it and mm. people would enjoy it, even though I was doing complicated poetic effects that they hated when I did them in line breaks. You'd, you'd show them this thing in line breaks and they'd go, yeah, I got to go, I got an appointment. Um, the same thing in paragraphs, and they loved it. So I thought, why not try this with the Iliad? Instead of sacrificing everything for this prosody, which doesn't even work in English because we don't have the same tools, why not sacrifice the prosody and keep the story? And I, I, I don't know. I, once I started doing it, it felt really natural. You know, there are mm -hmm. those writing projects that just seem to flow so well that you start to worry Am I crazy here? Um, because it shouldn't be this fun and easy, but it, it kind of was fun and easy. Uh, and it, when, you, when you do it that way, it becomes a beautiful book um, and a, one that you can see people enjoying. And one thing I found in the Iliad when I started studying it really carefully is this is something that was meant to be performed. And it was meant mm -hmm. to be performed by storytelling hams like myself. Um, there are some clear cues at every point, uh, like, okay, do up the comedy, do up the pathos, do up the gore. And if, if you have any sense of, of how to tell a story, those cues are very clear. Mm -hmm. And that that helped to make it really easy. Did it uh, before I, I get back to that? I just want to ask: like, did rewriting and getting so deep into the story did it did it make you? I mean, did it make you just very much more impressed by Homer maybe than you had been before? Did, were, had had you even really read much Homer before that? Like, since since you were a child, did it? I mean, where would you rate him now, now that you've rewritten his book compared to others in terms of his dramatic sense and his storytelling and, um, you know, his gold well, and yeah. comedy? I, you know, here's, here again, the Guild intervenes to say, hang on a minute. I mean, <laughs> uh, I once knew a classics professor whose favorite phrase was, hang on a minute. <laughs> and uh, that, hang on a minute. Yeah. Homer? Homer yeah. Yeah, but was there such a person as, okay. Right, Homer. Right. Let, let's take Homer as a group mind. Yes. Um, this was a really good group mind. Um, I've read a lot of other epics, and uh, you know, at the time I was I was quite uh, interested in Irish culture, uh, which is putting it mildly. Um, I read uh, the the great Irish epic, the Toyn Bo Cooley, the the Cattle Raid of Cooley, and it's not a bad story. Uh, and it's got a lot of very funny bits, which, by the way, the Iliad also has. The mm -hmm. Iliad is a very funny book, and nobody mm -hmm. realizes that. But the Toyn is is not anywhere near as good as the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad is is a moment from long family stories that are followed after this and uh, come down 
from earlier generations of uh, family stories. The, the Greek mythos is just astonishing. I mean, you said this in your review of the Bible. Mm -hmm. like, uh, once you've read the Greek myths, it's really hard to have a lot of respect for the little rustic stories of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something weird and interesting about the New Testament, as you said, but but in general, it's like there's no comparison. And, and that's what I found comparing this Irish epic and other epics. Um, Gilgamesh is a, a touching story uh, about death. Um, but again, it, it doesn't compare as far as I've seen. And obviously, I'm reading it in translation. So maybe I, maybe I shouldn't trust the translations. But the Iliad is, is wonderful. And it's wonderful in ways that nobody suspects except this really interesting Victorian guy, Samuel Butler, who mm. was uh, force fed the Greek classics in a public school taught to the tune of a hickory stick and he hated Greek tragedy, but he didn't exactly hate Homer. And he wrote a really interesting essay, The Humor of Homer. And that, along with Nietzsche's insight into the ancient Greeks, that above all they were other and they enjoyed cruelty and they found cruelty hilarious. And if you don't understand that about them, you'll never get them. Uh, Butler and Nietzsche combined sort of inform what I did with the Iliad. And, uh, well, I think you are... also brought your own style and taste into yeah. it as well. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it, it is, the, in my reading of it, it is kind of a, a good meeting. I mean, you, you, you know, you were respectful <laughs> to the original author, uh, and Kim Floor, but, but, um, it definitely has your, the Warner, uh, particularly the Warner, you know, character style stamp on it. And appropriately so. It's a book about, it's a war epic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there, there have been some interesting studies of the Iliad as a war book. And I'm indebted to Michael Pollock, friend of the show, and polymath extraordinaire, for writing to me about Jonathan Shea's book, uh, Achilles in Vietnam. Uh, where he makes comparisons between the Iliad and the Vietnam vet stories he heard hmm. as a psychiatrist. And he says, what you get in the Iliad is uh, post-traumatic stress due to institutional betrayal. Hmm. Um, Agamemnon absolutely betrays the army and causes the deaths of all kinds of really good fighters and, hmm. and He's he kind of exaggerates. He's comparing the Vietnam War with uh, that is a real war that happened in his own culture with the Iliad, a fictional account of a war that maybe sort of happened uh, more than uh, 2,700 years ago. But given that, he makes a lot of really good points that, you know, Achilles starts out pretty sane. He's mm. not one of the meaner people in the book. Uh, but after being betrayed by Agamemnon, after uh, getting his best friend and foster brother killed, uh, wearing his armor, he basically goes insane and, and in the second half of the book behaves like a complete maniac. Uh, and there's no doubt uh, that Agamemnon is the villain of the book. That's something that Butler understood, that's something mm. that Shea understands. But amazingly, a lot of uh, classicists don't seem to understand that. You still see Agamemnon referred to as a pattern of kingship or a model of kingship, and that is hmm. just nonsense. Agamemnon is a disastrous king and mm. causes the death of most of the people who uh, go down to Hades in the Iliad. Yeah, the one the one of the things that does strike me as similar, but uh, but in a very kind of hickish way with uh, some of the the better parts of the Old Testament, is how catastrophically vain and stupid powerful people repeatedly are. Whether it's God, I'm, Yahweh, even at times the early Yahweh reminds me of some of these gods, incredibly vain, um, prone to making really stupid decisions. Um, Nothing gets them angrier than thinking that these that these nasty little mortals aren't paying enough attention to them, uh, you know. Um, and people constantly screwing up. Um, and and I mean, it's kind of surprising, especially in the 
the the the books that start off with Samuel through Kings and David and and Solomon and those that that um, how how many mistakes that they make. But again, it, like you said about the uh, the Irish uh, epics, it's it is just kind of remarkable how how simple. I don't know what else to put it, like kind of how how just simple the the tales are. Um, and this is definitely not simple. I mean, these these characters are. They're more like our different. They're more like um, they're more human in a way, but in very exaggerated ways. They're much more human and recognizable in all of their different mistakes and pains and and agonies that they that they kind of express. But um, let me get let me get back to something you were on, talking about earlier. I want to read this part from the introduction here, which gets back to kind of how you approach this book and how you see you know, that this is a book meant to be read and heard. You may have heard of this story as something called the Iliad found only on undergraduate syllabi, but this story was never meant as a textbook. This is a campfire story, the greatest of all tall tales. It moves easily from tone to tone, from raw slapstick comedy to ultraviolence that makes Clockwork Orange seem like a panto for Eaton lads, to hard-earned pathos that will moisten your mucous membranes whether you like it or not. I've called it Rage because that was its name back when people listened to it around the hearth. My job as delivery guy is to give you this wonderful story as close to its raw, funny, weepy, haunted original as I can. Um, and so, and I think that's that's a great introduction it's so that people aren't sort of shocked that, oh, I'm supposed to actually, I can actually enjoy this, read it and enjoy yeah. it chapter to chapter. And it, it's really is a page turner. Um, well, that's that was my way of dealing with, and I, I expect any classicist reading this to fail to notice, but the first line of my introduction was, you know, I didn't write this story. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the only way I could think of conveying in contemporary English uh, the invocation of the muse, uh-huh. which is how most people begin the Iliad. And uh, there, there are two main translations right. bouncing around undergraduate syllabi now one by Richmond Lattimore and one by Robert Fitzgerald. And they both take the invocation of the muse uh, very literally, not correctly, because you can't do the prosody of the Iliad correctly in English. But here's how Lattimore did it in 1951. Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus, son Achilleus, and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans, hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades, strong souls of heroes, but gave their bodies to be the delicate feasting of dogs of all birds, and the will of Zeus was accomplished since that time when first there stood in division of conflict Atreus, son, the lord of men and brilliant Achilleus. I am lost. Yes, me too. I remember this now. I'm already thinking, how much more time is this going to take, and how do I slip (laughs) out of here? You know. How many, yeah, the way undergraduates read, you know, like, okay, I've got 27 <laughs> pages. I should be able to do that by 4 o'clock yeah. and I can get out of here. Yeah, um, that, I don't think you could even diagram that as a sentence. Um, and you cannot claim that it is authentic to the original because the, uh, the original was accessible easily and pleasurably to its audience. And if it's not easily and pleasurably you know, Stephen said about um, the poem, it must give pleasure. And there is no damned way that what I just read <laughs> is going to give anybody pleasure. It's going to give them a headache the night before the exams when they're trying to remember this. Um, it's the reason so, why I always, and I'm, I'm as you read it, I actually kind of remembered that. Because I remember the Lattimore, at least one version of it, had a kind of cool cover, and it always attracted me to it. And I... I you know I've always been interested in all the um, Greek old Greek texts, but every time I read that opening, I put it right back in the shelf. And um, and <laughs> thank <and>, you, go. <laughs> whereas your opening, um, I don't. You, can you read the first paragraph? Actually, I mean, compare what you just read to uh, go beyond where you said I didn't write the story because it's it's great. Sure. I didn't write this story. I'm just delivering it. Every now and then, it has to be repackaged and delivered. It comes from way back, from the gods. You'll meet them in here. They're not the gods you might be expecting, though. These are more like the Sopranos. <laughs> I love that. They are more like the Sopranos. They're and they're beautiful in a way. The other, the other 
the other American cultural product that kept reminding me of the gods was married with children because <laughs> uh, I mean if, if I grew up in a place very much like what they're trying to describe in married with children and yet what struck me after years of watching it is like only Bud looks like the people I knew there. Only Bud. <laughs> yeah. The others are like Olympian gods yeah. having a fun time being lower middle class Americans. <laughs> They're just twice the size of yeah. them, far more beautiful, much funnier. Peg, she's great. Yeah. <laughs> the, the wife. Peg would make a good yeah. Hera. She would, sure. yeah. And speaking of that then, I don't know, do you want, I, I like one of my favorite scenes, uh, uh, many great scenes, but is the beginning of chapter two, stick to war, love is too dangerous. Um, because this is also, I mean, the, your very first chapter, you you as a narrator don't come in yet. Uh, uh, but in this one, you do kind of come in and step back. And that's that's the way the, the Greeks would do it too. They had the chorus, right, that would come in and kind of talk to the audience, it's sort of like the narrator yeah. in a Bugs Bunny cartoon, you know. Money. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I don't know. Do you want to read that, or you want me to, or the whole me? chapter? Or where no, do you no, no. From? Just um, now. Now Zeus has to kill even more of the Greeks, um, and you know, go for a couple paragraphs at least. Okay. Or three paragraphs, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now Zeus has to kill even more of the Greeks. His first thought, a painful, wincing one. Hera's not going to like this. His wife and sister Hera always knows what he's up to. And she's soft on the Greeks. She's permanently mad at him anyway because he's just an old horn dog pretending to be in command when he can't even command his own penis. These people were very down on lust. That's one of yeah. This is where I'm I'm sort of I felt I had to explain this because it's very different from our culture. These people were very down on lust. That's one of the ways they weren't like us. We love lust. They didn't. It was too dangerous and it gave women too much power. So lust is a bad thing in this story. To these people, a real man doesn't get led around by his dick. And if he does, he's not a man at all. A stud, to way, their way of thinking, is a sissy. And above all, a sissy stud is dangerous, capable of wiping out an entire city. And I, and I'm, I'm, one I'm, more I'm, paragraph, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. The man who started this whole war was a stud, a, pro, a Trojan prince named Paris, fitting for a man with the sexual ego of Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> The only reason he didn't drive a Porsche or wear Ray-Bans was because the infrastructure wasn't there yet. He'd have defected to Malibu in a second if the airport had been, airport had been ready. And this princeling Paris had the chance to judge a beauty contest of three female gods. And that's what got Troy besieged. I, yeah, I felt a little funny writing that because, as you say, I'm stepping out for the moment. But I love look, that. It's, yeah. it's been 2,700 years and... <laughs> uh, it's important to say these people were not us. They don't think the same way we think. I and mean, I didn't really understand some aspects of California culture because it sort of hit me on the head and then said, on your way. <laughs> uh, and until I started doing the Iliad and saw, yes, yes, there are other ways of imagining this world. I mean, Paris would do really well in California. And so would Helen. They'd be top of the line. Mm -hmm. they'd, they'd run the place. But in the world of the Iliad, they're the bad guys. Because there's a cliche, you know, it, it's not about sex, it's about power. That is absolutely themist. That is actually absolutely right behavior for the world of the Iliad. It is not supposed to be about sex. It's supposed to be about power and producing offspring. And that's that. The idea that that lust uh, is an aim in itself um, is the closest thing to villainy in, in the book, and and Paris and Helen are both villains. Mm -hmm. Not quite like Agamemnon. That's an interesting case. Mm -hmm. Ag Agamemnon is a bad king; they're just bad people. It's a weakness, and it's a it's a re it makes them almost ridiculous. But in a dangerous, in a way that that also makes them dangerous. I'm trying to think like, I don't know. It's almost it's this is not the right way because Fredo is not not pretty in any way. But um, but it is a, a kind of a dangerous and ridiculous character like Fredo. I don't know why I keep thinking of yeah. him because he can get you in trouble because he's yeah. weak, you know. And and uh, 
the way he's depicted in the movie, you knew early on in the movie um, because he was weak and because he was trying, he was going to somehow get everybody in trouble. Well, in the end, he and after them. all, he was he was banging chorus girls two at a yeah. time. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Um, right. So, where do you want to go from here? Well, I mean, what what I really saw once I started once I I saw that I had the liberty to do uh, the Iliad as a war story. It it almost became pure enjoyment, and and the big part of the enjoyment was the gods. I mean, mm-hmm. if you happen to see the movie Troy, uh, which was basically Brad Pitt prancing around in Greek costume, uh, the the astonishing thing about Troy is, I don't remember any of the gods in that movie at all. I've been corrected on that by people who say, no, 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 Athena appears in one scene for about five seconds, but that's not the Iliad. Uh, in the Iliad, the gods are the movers. They are the motive power of, of the whole world. Um, and the Iliad begins with this uh, captive girl watching as her old father limps down the beach to beg Agamemnon, the vile Greek leaguer, to release her. Um, and Agamemnon purposely shames him in a, in a really over-the-top way. And that's a bad idea, not because you should be nice to people. There's no such idea in the Iliad. But because he's a priest of Apollo, which is, you know, he, he has a roof. And Apollo is uh, quite a serious roof. And uh, so Apollo watches this. Apollo is sort of floating over the scene. And Apollo is a very strange god. They're all strange in their own ways. This is something you can't do with monotheism. But, you know, each of the gods in the Iliad has their own tone, their own music in some way. I mean, uh, Poseidon is a stubborn, old, weird, semi-sentient being. Athena is like pure will. Um, Hera is the angry matron. But Apollo, Apollo is the sun and the falcon and a, a lot of old Eastern ideas. There's a reason he's the god of the sun. He comes up out of the East and, and he is from the East. He, he's less human than a lot of the newer gods. And there's this sense in the Iliad, there are generations of gods. And Apollo is, as I say in the book, uh, a young man but an old god. And he comes from a generation when they hadn't really mixed with humans. There's a sense that Zeus's brats are almost half-breeds, but Apollo is a different matter. Um, So he sees his priest humiliated, and then he begins to uh, take his revenge, and he's very happy about this. So I'll I'll just give a a sample passage of uh, the the revenge of Apollo after his priest is humiliated. So Agamemnon sneers at the old man. You want to cry? You want something to cry about, drooler, dog face? If you don't get out of my face right now, uh, sorry, out of my sight right now, I'll show you what it is to cry. So go! She hears a shuffle, an old man stumbling walk, fading away. Agamemnon shouts after him. That's right, waddle off. The soldiers sigh, get up to leave. No use arguing with Agamemnon when he's like this. The feeble old priest stumbles off over the dunes. He has been shamed, but he has a weapon of his own. He can call on his master, Apollo. He has credit with the god. He spent whole decades burning meat and fat on Apollo's altar, sending up the nice steak smell the gods like, just so he'll have a weapon to deploy in a moment like this. He limps down into a hollow in the dunes and falls to his knees. He breathes more slowly and deeply. The sniffling stops. He calls to the sky in a younger voice. Apollo, you heard all that as well as I, Lord. You saw what the Greek king did to your priest. I am nothing. But for the sake of all that fat meat I've sent smoking up to you, for the sake of your own pride, punish them. Kill them, Lord Apollo of the bright bow. Make them beg me to take my daughter back. This is music to Apollo, floating, riding the breeze from the sea. Besides, he likes the old man. Many a fine strip of fat has this priest laid over marrow-thick femurs for Apollo to sniff. And the human is humble, 
unlike those pushy Greeks. And what he asks is what Apollo has been itching to do anyway, and that always helps. Apollo hates the Greeks. He's been flexing his bow, waiting to be provoked. And now Agamemnon has given him the perfect excuse to send some poison arrows at the Greek campfires on the shore. He laughs, glittering like sun on the waves. Thank you, Agamemnon. You are my favorite Greek. Apollo is good at drawing out the pain as Agamemnon himself, so he doesn't kill the Greeks immediately. That sort of quick, easy death is something an amateur would do. He wants to have some fun with Agamemnon, just as Agamemnon likes to have his fun with the slave girl and he wants to make it last. So he starts killing everyone in the Greek camp. But to increase the terror, draw out the art agony, he starts low, the animals. First the mules tied up near the beach boats. Apollo sends his viral arrows fizzing and sizzling down through the mules thick hides, easily as a needle through flax. The mules eyes cross, their muzzles foam, they kick and squeal and topple over. By the time the slaves wake at dawn, the Greek mules are lying stiff as fallen trees, their legs splayed out. Then the dogs. If there's one thing these little kings love more than their mules, it's their dogs. Friends on the hunt. The one contribution they deign to make to feeding the commoners. Friends at the feast. Toss them a hunk of bone and gristle before passing out drunk at the table. Friends in battle providing a little comic relief by biting the corpses their masters make, lapping up the enemy's pooling blood. Oh, they love their dogs. So Apollo sends his fizzing arrows festering with tiny malevolent life into the dogs, and the howls howl and hounds howl and itch and die there on the beach, ending lineages longer and purer than most of their masters. By this time, the smarter Greeks can see the trend. Mules, then dogs, not hard to figure out who's next. And sure enough, the men begin to die. Again, Apollo starts from the bottom, commoners first. He loves this game. He even deigns to coalesce, become visible, for a fraction of a second above his chosen targets. A few look up and see him as the envenomed dart dissolves in their flesh. Their expressions are hilarious. Soon the unburied bodies are swelling up and bursting with a terrible smell all over the camp. Anyway... So that's, that's so great. I mean, no, that's just, yeah. that's beautiful and horrible. It's, um, you know, you think God, the poor dogs and, and, and Apollo, what's he, what's he got against dogs? But I mean, it, 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 it accentuates how, how, I mean, how kind of merciless the Greeks were in their, in the stories that they loved. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of sadistic, merciless quality to it. Like, yeah. And quite that, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to accept uh, the beauty and the cruelty and the humor all at once. Um, I was doing some interview with somebody else, and they they said, what's the point of the Iliad? And that's not the question I usually think about very much, and I sort of had to guess quickly. And it's all I could say was it's like the glory of living in a demon-ruled, horrible world. <laughs> Yeah, that was one thing that's kind of striking. The gods, the gods are generally vain, often petty and and ridiculous and really vicious, and they just they they really they love torturing the Greeks and they they kind of they love to hate the Greeks. And the Greeks yeah. you the Greeks make it very hard to feel sorry for them until the gods just go further and further and further, like in the scene with Apollo. It's sort of like, yeah, Agamemnon deserves it. Okay, what's he going to do? And it's like, wow, that's pretty brutal. Why did you do that? Like, what, what, you're really serious about making him suffer, aren't you? Um, and then you kind of, so your, your, your sympathies and your emotions get really kind of whipsawed around. Yeah, and of course, all the, I mean, th this is where Jonathan Jay has a point with the idea of uh, command betrayal. Agamemnon has uh, has offended Apollo, but uh, Apollo doesn't kill Agamemnon. Mm -hmm. um, he kills just about everybody else and uh, lets that moral weight lie upon Agamemnon because there's not a, a Christian notion of virtue here, but there is a notion of responsibility. And Agamemnon is supposed to be responsible for these people. And by acting like a jerk, 
with a, a connected guy, a priest of Apollo. He gets his own people killed. And that is, mm-hmm. well, I guess you could call it a sin. Mm-hmm. I love this. Um, I think this is earlier on um, this earlier description of Agamemnon. I mean, first of all, I think set up the story. And then I'll, okay. I'm going to read the scene. But what is it about? And what is the story? Not, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty straightforward story. Mm-hmm. Uh, nice and simple. Um, although, like all the Greek stories, it goes back generations and it goes forward generations in, in other stories. Um, Paris was a guest at the house of Menelaus, uh, who's Agamemnon's brother. Um, they're both king kinglets or chieftains in Greece. Uh, He falls in love with Helen, uh, who's insanely beautiful and has God blood of her own, and that takes her back to Troy in uh, Turkey on on what's now the the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Um, Because a lot of this is about East versus West, Greece versus Asia. There's a really strong sense that I think most translators haven't got that Troy is Asian. Troy is is it's not all one culture exactly. There's um, the the bow is actually the weapon that defines the Asianness of Troy. The the Trojans are more interested in the bow. The Greeks consider the bow an effeminate weapon, even though they admit it. Yeah, it kills you, but it's <laughs> it's it's cowardly. Mm. Um, so. Because you're supposed to stand and fight, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, with a spear. Yeah. You use a spear. Oh, right. Even, right. The swords aren't very reliable. The swords usually break. And um, anyway, so uh, we're, there has to be revenge. Uh, Agamemnon and only cares about Menelaus because he's his brother, but he calls in all the favors. And uh, there's also the prospect of great plunder and rape and enslavement and also the sheer joy of killing people which is a big part of the uh so all of greece basically the the males of military age take ship and land at troy troy is inland you didn't build your cities right on the sea because there's too many predators on the sea so troy is a bit inland on a high place but the Greek ships all land on the beach and besiege the city. But that's not told in the Iliad. That's The Iliad starts after nine years of stalemate. Uh, they've been trying to take the city for nine years, and they haven't really gotten anywhere. Now the Iliad begins with this priest of Apollo begging for his daughter back. Uh, She was taken in a raid on one of the other cities along the coast because on your way to uh, sack and enslave Troy, you sack and enslave any other city linked to Troy uh, on your way because the opportunities for plunder are not something you'd want to pass up. So it starts with that. That uh, gets... Apollo uh, angry at the Greeks and sort of gives him a moral right within, you know, the five families of, of the gods, as it were. It's a very godfathery story. Uh, it gives him the, the right to start killing Greeks, but there are Greek gods that will never, never forgive the Trojans uh, because Paris not only stole Helen, but in an earlier story, he was, because he's a very pretty boy, which is also not a good thing in this story, uh, he was asked to judge between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite uh, in sort of a, a beauty contest, basically. But this is a Greek story. A beauty contest is not really a beauty story, uh, a beauty contest. It's about, show some brains, you idiot. Who are you going to pick? Who can help you? Hera has the strongest will of any of the gods. Zeus is easily distracted. He's, you know, he's picking his nose or sexually harassing somebody. Um, Hera never gets distracted. Um, Her will is stronger than anyone else's. 
Her daughter, Athena, is the personification of many things. Uh, craftiness, just war. Uh, Athena is by far the most interesting character mm-hmm. in the book, and the, the center of the book. So he could have picked either of those, and he, he, they would have given him gifts that would have made him the most powerful man in the world. But Aphrodite is sexy, and he's obsessed with sex, so he picked Aphrodite. That means he has chosen to make a weak god, a love god, his patron, and he has offended the two most powerful gods aside from Zeus. I mean, Zeus has all the power. He says over and over again to all the other gods, you know I could kick all of your asses, and I could put you down under the floor the way I put those titans. It's kind of a horrible story. They're not The titans aren't even dead necessarily. They're just laid under the floor. Uh, and at another point he says to Hera, don't make me mad. Remember what happened when you made me hang you up by your hair all night? I couldn't even sleep for the screaming. Uh, so he's got brute strength, but Hera has the will. Athena has the brains. Aphrodite has nothing but glamour. So now Paris returns to Troy with Helen. He has no legitimate right to her. Everybody in Troy says, give her back. Don't be stupid. Give her back. Apologize. But he won't because he's controlled by lust, which is bad. Uh, and because he's the brother of Hector the, and, the, and the son of Priam, the king of Troy, no one can simply tell him to give her back. So... Troy has no choice but to endure this siege, and everyone knows how it will turn out. The city will be taken, the men and boys will all be killed, the women and girls will all be enslaved. Uh, And everyone knows that from the beginning of the book, just as Achilles knows he's going to die there. Um, Everyone knows how it's going to play out. And they've been playing at this for nine years, and they're all exhausted. I mean, you've got to imagine camping in tents for nine years on a windy beach, Uh, near some rotting ships and and never getting into the city. Um, And the Iliad actually covers the last, I think it's 53 days of the war, less than two months. Uh, Well, not the last days of the war, just the war up to the point that Hector dies. In fact, when I put the book up, uh, somebody I know on... uh, Facebook said, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, (laughs) Hector dies, (laughs) Um, which is true. That's the end of the book, uh, the funeral of Hector. Um, And the the Iliad covers only this little piece of the war from the moment that Agamemnon uh, offends Apollo, because Agamemnon, in revenge for having to give back Apollo's daughter, that's what he does after the plague. It's like, okay, okay. Damn you, Apollo! You made your point. Here's the girl, and I hope you choke on her. You know, and but then he says to Achilles, "But I'm taking your girl instead." And Achilles says, basically, "You can't do that to me. You're shaming me in front of all the men. I'm a king just like you, and I'm a better man than you, which everybody knows. Achilles could pull Agamemnon's head off with one hand." Uh, And then he adds, very much as a distant third, besides, I really like that girl. Um, But it's, you know, in that order. Um, You're shaming me in front of the men. I am a king. I am as good as you. And I liked her. At that point, Achilles stops fighting, and his men stop fighting. And uh, the gods turn against the Greeks because of Agamemnon's bad behavior. And then a lot of Greeks get slaughtered. Zeus has made a deal with Achilles' mother, uh, who knows, Thetis, who knows that he's going to die young. Everybody's always telling Achilles, you're going to die young, and he's always going, I know. I know. (laughs) (laughs) At times it's funny, and at times it's, it's really sad. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's, it's it kind is. of reminds me of, of the fir- uh, the original Blade Runner. You know, it's it, it's yeah. more life, but it can't happen. Yeah, it can't happen, mm-hmm. and and it's worse in a way than than Rutger Hauer and Blade Runner because at least he's going to cease existing. Mm-hmm. In the in the Greek world, uh, it's it reminds me of Flannery O'Connor's line: "You can't be any poorer than dead." In fact, I think she may have gotten that from Homer because. Achilles isn't, 
you don't see his death in the Iliad, but in the Odyssey, Odysseus meets Achilles in the afterlife. Achilles, the greatest hero of all, and Achilles is in the same afterlife as everybody else. There's, there's not a real sense that good people go one place, bad people go another. Everybody goes to this sort of foggy waiting room where they wait forever, and that's all they do. And Achilles comes forward out of the fog and says to Odysseus, oh, Odysseus greets him and he says, how are you doing? How's things down here? Um, and Achilles says this great line, um, it would be better to be a slave to a landless peasant out in the boondocks than to be the king of all the dead. Uh, so that's all you got to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, the Greeks were definitely m merciless. Maybe that's why Christianity eventually took over. <laughs> like, I think I'll take yeah. a, a heaven as an, at least an option, you know, in this, or even hell. But um, um, yeah. uh, one thing, uh, yeah, as you were talking about this, uh, one thing kind of popped in my head, dragged me to hell. I don't, did you ever see the Sam Raimi movie, the horror movie, Drag Me to Hell? I, it yes. just So the scene with, um, with Apollo's... Uh, 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 old man who came up to Agamemnon reminds me. I mean, so the the girl and and uh, the young woman who's the bank teller or, or the bank uh, employee. She's obviously she's actually very sympathetic, unlike Agamemnon. But there's a kind of similar. You know, it's a sort of gr uh, disgusting old person who comes for you know for some kind of help and gets kind of brutally rejected and then calls on a god to torture the person who shamed them. Um, and the Lamia, the god, does torture the hell out of her. It's, it's kind of a frightening movie at times. Yeah, because it's not like we're just going to kill you. No. Killing is quick. Killing is yeah for amateurs. I mean, uh, the the ancient world, and frankly, a lot of the modern world, specializes in in slow torturing to death, uh, not just killing. And yeah, I remember that. Uh, the Iliad has weird echoes in movies, and I think this is because movies are about as close to unselfconsciousness as you get in this culture. Like, we've often talked about Army of Darkness, um, and I think I mentioned uh, when we were talking to Eileen the funny moment when I, I had a bunch of academics over to watch Army of Darkness, and one of them who'd been frowning for a long time said after about 45 minutes, but this is just a celebration of male violence. <laughs> like, well, yeah, uh, that's kind of this is patriarchal culture, and, yeah. and you know one of the one of the strange things about academics in that way is that uh, it is an article of faith with with people like the the person who said that in my house that patriarchy is the dominant fact of our existence, and yet they're eternally surprised by it. And <laughs> and as I said to her at the time, it's like. It's like you're a marine biologist who's like outraged every time you see some salt water. And <laughs> if, if, that, if that's supposed to be the substance of this world, then you should not be surprised to find it in in the text. I mean, and the Iliad is is a very conservative text in that way. It, it, uh, but at the same time, it manages to have moments of great humor, like Army of Darkness, flipping rather easily between um, the grandiose and and the slapstick. Mm -hmm. Um, so very early on in an early chapter, again, when we're first kind of getting introduced to what a really unlikable person Agamemnon is, um, I just, I just love this one moment. I'm sorry. It's, it's when Zeus is, Zeus is trying to start messing with him by, by putting some really bad ideas, bad dreams into his head. Um, and you have this line here, um, then in a pure moment, uh, he has uh, himself a better idea. So Ag Agamemnon wakes feeling um, odd, pleased, or happy. One of those words people use. Strange, but never mind. And he's got these plans. And then in a pure Agamemnon moment, he has himself a better idea. Agamemnon... How should I properly say that, by the way? Agamemnon or Agamemnon? Agamem Agamemnon. Okay, so you do pronounce it. Agamemnon is always getting a better idea, and may the gods help anyone on his side when that happens. He thinks, why attack Troy? That's too simple, too obvious. Like all truly stupid people, Agamemnon hates the obvious. I love that line. Like all truly stupid people, Agamemnon hates the obvious. Yeah. <laughs> no, he thinks, I'll test my army. I'll see who's really loyal enough to me. And, you know, 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's. I think we've talked about this. I mean, there's the the really bad impulse to distrust the obvious. It's it cuts all across yeah. so many different things, and it, I, I don't <laughs> think that word is ever used other than disingenuously. Um, I mean, when somebody says, "Well, that's obvious." Uh, there's something funny going on there. Mm -hmm. um, the obvious tends to be really important. Um, and often I, what strikes me about it is, and this comes up when you're talking about atrocities, uh, when there's an atrocity people don't want to hear about, they'll say, oh, everybody mm -hmm. knows that. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it so well that I never find any mention of it when I go to do my research. I notice it a lot when people get upset over something that is... Um... I don't know, we've revealed that that is that's horrifying, like, you know, something that the government did in some war or something bad the government does. There's always that group of people who say, well, that's obvious. Of course they do that. We all know. That. Like, well, yeah. Yeah. Know. There are all kinds of variants, like mm. the the tedious undergraduate one of um, I knew all about that way before you did. It's like, OK, OK, good. You get extra points. Now, let's see what we can do about it. Um, and. That also implies that if you mention it now, you just found out about it, so you're mm, cool. You're not cool, yeah. yeah. Um, another line in here I love. Um, Ares wanting justice? Ares who presided over every massacre and rape since the beginning of the world and enjoyed every second of them, and now he wants justice? Justice? After getting stabbed by a woman, his own sister, in the groin? It's a great moment for the whole family. They just can't stop laughing. I just love that little passage there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the most interesting things about the Greek gods that usually, you know, people say, oh, Ares is the god of war. Well, it's not that simple. Um, there are at least two gods, maybe three, that are involved, maybe four. Yeah. A lot Athena of is a war god, right? Yeah, I mean, Athena is like the god of just war, mm -hmm. of uh and strategy and, and thinking about war. Um, when Hephaestus uh, makes Achilles a shield, he shows Athena leading the defenders of the city out to attack the brigands uh, because she fights legitimate war. Ares is despised not only by the other people in the god family, but by whoever wrote or whatever group of people wrote the Iliad. I mean, he's he's stupid. He's disgusting. He's not the god of war. He's the god of of, of atrocities, basically, uh, because these people lived with war all the time in a way that we really don't. And and they knew what a corpse smells like, and they knew what a cloud of flies on a dead face looks like and sounds like and they gloried in war in some ways there's a lot of humor about death there's a lot of pure worship of strength in a figure like achilles but there's also real disgust at um the filth of war and Ares represents that he's not the god of war he's the god of um Slaughter, mm. which is the title to chapter eight. Uh, but by the way, so your titles to the chapters, did you put those in or? I put those in. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah. And you have um, these great illustrations. Well, you have a great book cover, too. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I, oh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. I, I, this cover is fantastic. Uh, and it it came as a complete surprise. Um I wasn't sure what we should do with the cover and got a message on the war on the Gary Brecher Facebook page uh, from a guy in Istanbul named Memo Kosanen, who said he was a fan of the show and the sent Turkish along artist. Sample. Yeah. Oh, sent okay. along a sample of his artwork and he did these fantastic God creatures. And uh, I knew instantly uh, he was the person to do the cover illustration for this book. So um, I said, uh, I, I negotiated with him and said, here's this one passage with Athena in it. Can you do a painting of Athena? And this is his Athena, as terrifying as she should be, 
on the cover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's it's. I, I seem to recall when you were either in Turkey or somewhere in the Balkans, uh, Mimo had a um, uh, an art showing, and I think you posted some some links to it, and it was. It, I mean, it was really interesting. Yeah, he does there. incredible beasts. He does mm. uh, quasi human beasts. I mean, he seems awesome. to tap into the the old cool stuff that people used to draw and that kids still draw until they're educated out of it. In case uh, you, you haven't, uh, you don't have a copy of the book. Um, the last name of the artist did this brilliant cover. Uh, it's spelled K as in kite, O S E M as in Mark, E N as in Nancy. So getting back to, to chapter eight, Slaughter, this is a great scene, sort of, you know, you, you talked about earlier how the gods are kind of like the godfather or or the Sopranos, and this is very much a Soprano scene. Um, you know, Zeus is sick of this war, nine years of killing, no results. He calls the family to conference and lays down the law. And you almost want to read it like, you know, no more meddling with the Greeks or the... I can't do it. I can't do it with Marlon Brando. Or, or you want to have a New York axe, you know. Yeah. I, you read it, though. It's, it's great. No more meddling with the Greeks or the Trojans. Can you read a little bit of that right there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Zeus is sick of this war. Nine years of killing, no results. He calls the family to conference and lays down the law. No more meddling with the Greeks or Trojans trying to tilt the battle. No more interference from any of you gods or goddesses. As he says, or goddesses, he looks hard at Hera and Athena. Athena is sulking, refusing to look him in the eye. Zeus says, Maybe you all need to be reminded that I could throw the whole bunch of you into Tartarus, one layer below hell. Would you like that? I threw the Titans down there, and all you put together aren't as strong as they were. See, and that, and that right there, again, Army of Darkness comes to mind, you know? Yeah. Who wants some, huh? You? Yeah. You want some? <laughs> you want a little? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, one corrective that I really found... Uh, refreshing when when focusing hard on the Iliad is that this notion that you know uh, there's some reverence for Zeus as the father of the family is just not really true. <laughs> Zeus is the strongest, period. That's why he's in charge. I mean, there's a kind of sentimental value attached to the old Nestor, but it's a very tricky thing. If Zeus were old and weak, he wouldn't last a day. It's pure physical power mm-hmm. he can kill so he goes on he hunches over this table to let them see his strength suppose we were to play tr- tug of war with all of you dragging me down toward earth i'd pull you all up into the sky instead and the whole earth and ocean with you i'm the papa here and don't you forget it I, again i feel like there's got to be a new york accent there i'm the papa <laughs> here don't use forgets it and like you should say use you know <laughs> I can't say you. <laughs> I, I can't get away with it. But yeah, right, yeah, it, it's like that. I mean, K- uh, keep going though, because then it, it's okay. great the back and forth with Athena. I mean, this really is. It's sort of Godfather meets married with children here. So yeah, yeah. 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 Athena speaks up. Papa, we all know you have the final say, but you can't blame Mama and me for being sad when we see so many brave Greek warriors dying down there at Troy. Zeus is about to rage at her when she smiles, suddenly girlish, and pipes up. Papa, what if we didn't interfere directly, but just made some suggestions to the Greeks, a little advice? And, you know, this is Athena playing it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, She can be, she's a pure killer when she wants to be, but she's also Zeus's daughter. She literally chewed her way out of his head. (laughs) Uh, That's how she was born. She treats Hera as her mother, but Hera is not in the biological sense her mother, as mm. far as we know. Um, Zeus is, in some weird army of darkness, biological way, <laughs> her father or her clone or God knows what. Mm. Um, Athena is endlessly weird. Athena is just like, wow, I was right to have a crush on her at age five when I first <laughs> met Athena. Well, yeah. I, was, I wasn't right in terms of having a prospect of a happy life, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I was right in the literary sense. Um, anyway, okay, uh, Zeus can't help laughing. Just suggestions, huh? Ah, girl, don't worry, I'd never hurt you. He turns to the rest of them. I'd never hurt you. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I'd never hurt you. He turns to the rest of them, but as for the rest of you, no more water meddling in the war, or you'll regret it. And this is where Hera actually has to deal with 
this ban because she will never stop interfering on behalf of the Greeks because Paris offended her. And uh, she meets another god, uh, Sleep, Hypnos or Hypnos, and she makes a deal with him that you, you don't imagine in the world of the Iliad. Uh, she wants him to put Zeus to sleep for a while, but the last time he did that, Zeus threw him several miles down to the earth. So he says, no way. And it's very much a gangland thing. No way. Look at what happened the last time I tried that. Nah, never. <laughs> and uh, he, she finally says, well, what about that uh, beautiful god girl? She's so young. Oh, you like them young, don't you? Mm. And uh, he says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he says, okay, this once. So he puts Zeus to sleep, taking the form of a vulture. And uh, Hera forcibly takes Aphrodite's gar girdle of sexiness from her, puts it on, and uh, then has sex with Zeus to keep him busy a little longer. It's a very sleazy scene mm -hmm. and also very funny. Mm -hmm. It cannot help but be funny. I don't know, I don't know how the classic skilled manage not to see the humor in the Iliad. Um, I'll bet you it made them uncomfortable. I, I think the humor, yeah. especially with it just made them uncomfortable. And they, you know, uh, they got out the thesaurus and said, "Obscure this up a little bit more." You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you put if you put this in dactylic hexameter yes. rendered into English, the humor would be pretty well leached out <laughs> of it, as if a bunch of very fat people had been treading on it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's a goddamn shame. All right. So I'm going to get to a really gory scene because there's a lot of incredible gore in this book and sometimes really funny, again, kind of army of darkness uh, gore in the book. Is there, is there a particular passage uh, that you might want to read? Well, there's a great, yeah. Well, um, I mean, there are a lot of scenes, but yeah. Because um, there's sort yeah, of a, there, it, it kind of swings back and forth between being really horrible and then so grotesque it's f almost funny and then going back to being just straight up horrible again yeah uh it's like slapstick yeah then I, there, there's a lot around the death of patroclus one one moment that uh i always remember although i'm not sure i can find it in the book immediately is when uh a trojan gets speared in the face and we're talking you know, we wander around the Balkans through museums looking at these spearheads, and uh, man, this is a nasty kind of war. Anyway, the spearhead hits him in the center of the face, and it, his face is described as breaking like a plate. And then his eyes fall out in the dust, and the Greeks laugh and say, you, drop a, you dropped a couple of eggs. There are a lot of scenes like that. There's another scene where uh, two sons of a, of a fortune teller get skewered on the same spear and the narrator says in what is obviously a joke they didn't see that one coming uh, <laughs> Jeez. And, uh, it's like a vague it's like a you know greek vegas guy uh, you know up in front of the yeah. campfire you know hey i didn't see that one coming for some fortune oh, yeah. teller aren't you you know and he brings out his his little fiddle like henny youngman or something like it's <laughs> yeah. yeah there's uh there's a lot of vegas stuff in here i mean the analogies we're finding are, well, you can start to see why the classic skilled is, is so eager to tilt this text a little. It's, it's actually a very low text, you know, in some ways. It's, it's for an aristocratic culture, but an aristocratic culture that did not think of aristocracy as, as a feat. I mean, and, and that notion in itself is very recent. I mean, even in Shakespeare, there's, uh, in The Tempest, she says, uh, don't provoke him, father. He is gentle and quick to anger, which doesn't make sense in modern English, but in uh, Jacobean English, it meant he is gentle. That is, he is high born mm. and quick to anger because those things go together. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just looking for a nice slaughter. Okay, well, um, the death of Sarpedon, uh, who's Zeus's own son, um, this is. Uh, from chapter 16. Trojans are dying in all sorts of strange ways. The Greek Penelaos faces off against a Trojan named Lycon, 
They throw their spears at the same moment and both miss. Then they draw swords and charge. Lycon hits uh, Penelaos' helmet, breaking his sword. Penelaos hits Lycon in the side of the neck. It's such a strong blow that Lycon's head is left hanging on by a strip of skin. He goes down to the dark like that, with his head flapping down his back like a mule saddlebag. Uh, there's many descriptions of that. And there's also a sense that I don't think other people have, have gotten clearly of um, the strata of the world in the, in the um, landscape of the Iliad. People think of Poseidon, for example, as the, the sea god, but that's not true. That's not how it works here. Poseidon divided the universe with his two brothers, Hades and Zeus. Zeus, the strongest, got the sky, the top. Hades got the underworld, which is described as a, a place of pure horror. Poseidon got the surface, and that means the sea and the earth. One of his epithets is earth mover or earth shaker. Um, but Poseidon is implicitly characterized as kind of not too bright, and he settled for uh, a kind of overlap zone because both Zeus and Hades can influence what happens on the surface. And uh, when so that the, there's a sense almost of gravity here, like one of those, you know, when I had chronic fatigue, I remember I used to watch those Looney Tunes things of Sylvester the cat falling through floor after floor after floor, and it suddenly wasn't funny anymore. And uh, there's there's a feeling like that in the Iliad that when you die, you literally fall uh, into Hades world and there is nothing good down there it's like a giant abscess below the surface of the earth um, so lick on here and, and this is comedy but it's kind of horror comedy horror comedy is a good description of a lot of the Iliad uh, he falls because life is sort of what keeps gravity at bay and when life is over you fall and he falls with his head flapping, you know, like a mule saddlebag. The, a, a purposely contemptuous metaphor, because uh, as, as Flannery O'Connor said, you can't be any poorer than dead. What happens in the chapter Rage? I mean, it's I mean, it's kind of smack in the middle of the book, and it's the title that you, um, it's not on the cover of the book, but it is the, the title you would give. It. Yeah, that that was a, a, a the publisher's choice um, mm -hmm. and a sensible one. I mean, uh, they said people won't know what you're talking about if if you say rage. But there's an argument that some classicists have made that people, the original audience, knew this as rage, not as the Iliad. The Iliad is, you know, a fanciful title. Mm -hmm. uh, Ilion, Troy, Iliad mm -hmm. means book about. Uh, but it's it's kind of stodgy. Rage would be a better title. Just can't do it. Um, well, uh, Zeus sends Rage to the battlefield, and the, the Greek gods are just so fun. And this is something that you know the Iliad gives you a chance to play with, especially if you're a science fiction fantasy fan like me. I mean, I, I don't know why people avoid that literature. When you try to, if you ever have to translate. Feel it, you damn well better start reading that stuff because mm -hmm. um, I think part of the reason that modern people can't translate this right is they haven't read enough fantasy science mm -hmm. fiction. They haven't learned to take non-human characters seriously. But in the Greek world, almost anything can become something like a, a being. And so like when Zeus sends the bad dream to uh, Agamemnon, that dream is is kind of a sentient being. And when Zeus sends rage to the battlefield, that abstraction, rage, becomes like a person who sort of multiplies itself into the body of every man fighting on the field. Um, in the same way, Nike, the, the uh, victory, she's the embodiment of, ab of an abstraction. Any, any abstraction can become a god, but they're usually in the hands of a personified god like Zeus. Mm -hmm. So um, Zeus finally wants this thing settled, and rage descends to the battlefield. 
So it goes, Zeus has sent them rage. As the two armies form up, rage screams like a hawk coming down on a rabbit. Every man holds his spear tighter, grinding his teeth, dreaming of pushing that pointed stick right through a writhing enemy. No envoys, no fine speeches. Because there's a, there's a protocol of battle which involves speeches and mm-hmm. offers of single combat, but that's all off now. Um, the two armies face off. Zeus sends a fine mist of dew down on the fighters' faces. The dew is blood red. Both sides charge each other without a word, and the killing begins. Rage is the only god Zeus allows on the field today. He's warned all the others not to interfere. And rage is like a god that can be summoned up and then put away. You know, there's the family, Zeus, Hera, Athena, Apollo, interlocking families. But there are also these other gods that are very science fiction, more like uh, almost embodied chemicals that can be injected into people and wear off after a while. Um, Like, for example, when Agamemnon finally has to do an apology to Achilles because the army has to fight together, his excuse, and it's a very 21st century American excuse, is I think I know now what happened when I stupidly took that captive girl from you, the one you liked. What happened, and this is real clear to me now, is that Zeus sent folly into my head. (laughs) And we all know that folly is Zeus's oldest daughter. So, you know, she's stronger than anybody. Uh, It is kind of a Greek thing, by the way, to blame the woman. So Mm. folly is a she. And uh, Zeus sent folly into my head and messed me up. Uh, It wasn't me. I was possessed. Yeah, there's this scene. There's also just a great scene here of, of fear entering Ajax's head. Zeus, uh, Zeus is trying to rig the battlefield in this chapter on rage, and uh, um, Odysseus is, is injured, and Ajax is coming to try to um, to, to, to help him, right? And, uh, and as Ajax is yanking his spear out of a Trojan's body, something strange happens in his head. Zeus has decided to take Ajax out of the fight by poisoning his mind with fear. The head was always Ajax's weak point. His shoulders are even stronger than Achilles. But a man needs to be strong in the head, too. Ajax is weak above the neck. Not slow-witted, like Menelaus, right? But softer. Better to be slow than soft. Uh, I love this line here. Ajax tries to ignore the fear. I mean, any of us (laughs) who... deal yeah. with fear, understand that, you know, uh, the many different ways you try to battle it. And, oh, I'm just ignore it, um, you know, and you yeah. know you're not ignoring it. It's or almost... I'll, be a, I'll be a coward throughout uh, <laughs> five meetings in a row and then say something suicidally stupid. <laughs> yeah. um, he runs after the Trojan, stabbing anyone in his range with his spear, slipping on blood and guts, moaning to himself, wanting to vomit. Something is rising inside him, a huge scream that will never stop. Now we can only see burst guts and spraying arteries. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing yeah. at spraying arteries, but there it is. You know. Spraying arteries are funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His head wants to explode. He grips his helmet and groans. I mean, I guess, you know, the Greeks had a very interesting notion, a much more, a much richer notion of laughter and the different. Yeah. Um, emotions that can go along with laughter. In fact, I think this is one of the things Nietzsche would write about when he wrote about the Greeks, too, that, you know, as we'll probably talk about later in the show today, certainly in American culture, we have an incredibly facile notion of comedy, satire, laughter. It should be, it, yeah. it's it's considered demeaning. It's it's only one or, very or offici- thin... Uh, uh, officially we have, but then we yeah. also have Army of Darkness and Married with Children and a whole bunch of exactly. other stuff. It's it's, it's weird. It's yeah. like there's the part of America that I, I was thinking about this because it's kind of a dismal moment right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was thinking there's such a difference between low or popular American culture, which yeah. is pretty glorious, mm-hmm. and what passes for high or elite culture, which is dismal, moralistic, and, and really just the 
Christian, the Protestantism of New England in the 19th century secularized, uh, as Nietzsche predicted it would be, um, but all the more strict because it no longer has doctrine behind it, just mm -hmm. a code of manners. Christianity without Christ, yeah. I want to ask you one other thing here, um, at least one other thing. One is that, I mean, who would you say is the most likable character in this book? Sympathetic, uh, is there? Uh, yeah, there. actually, almost everybody except Agamemnon is, and Paris. Among the Greeks, Agamemnon is unforgivable. Among the Trojans, Paris is unforgivable. Um, almost everybody else can be liked in some way or other. And, and uh, as you said, the Greeks have a much more subtle and inclusive way of thinking about this. Um, it depends on how you meet them and what they're like on the day. Uh, Athena is glorious. Athena was my first crush. And I, I, uh, she's, she's merciless and uh, weird, really weird, but, but she's amazing. And uh, Odysseus is interesting, too. He's almost like the the one smart person in a world where smart doesn't count for very much. Mm. Hector is, when there's real pathos, pure pathos in the text, it's almost always involving Hector. He's, as mm -hmm. some critics have said, he's like the one human being in, mm -hmm. in the text, the conscious human being in a world where uh, there are just these pawns and the people playing them. Um, and he's likable in that way, but it's too depressing, really. Uh, but that, that I guess this is what I wanted to say, that, that here you have the great war epic, and and the the enemy um, is incredibly sympathetic, and at the very least, no worse than the Greeks. And Not um, at all. Yeah. Um, and that's very unusual. I mean, if you want to compare it to, certainly... The, the Bible, uh, but but there's some similarities. Again, in the Bible, the Israelites, the Jews, uh, depending on which book you're in and what period, but generally, they they deserve everything they get, and they get a lot of bad stuff happening to them. But I don't recall in the Bible um, their opponents getting, you know, sympathetic treatment, deep sympathetic treatment ever. Once in a while, I think that's sort of like... Um, I think you kind of are made to feel like, wow, why did they have to slaughter every single one of them? There's something not right about that, you know, because God's really, in, or Yahweh is very much into extermination. Um, yeah. And it does seem excessive, and I and you can kind of even glean that from from the the um, you know the Hebrews in, in the Bible. But but you don't, they're not fleshed out at all the way the Trojans are. And the Trojans, as you said, they're not... I think one way people have kind of dealt with that is, well, they're also Greek. They're kind of trying to make it seem like it's, you know, uh, blue and gray. It's it's the Civil War, yeah. brother versus brother. And it's not that, though. No, no. The Trojans are a little different from the Greeks, though sharing a sort of uh, Eastern Mediterranean thing. But a lot of their allies are just plain weird. Mm. And, and and the book gets into that in right. many ways. And, and the bow is their preferred weapon. As I said, that marks them as Asian. Um, some of them are described as coming from Syria. In fact, one, one of the, you meet a lot of characters in the Iliad only when you see them die, and it's like, ah, and then so-and-so came mm -hmm. from the banks of the Orontes in Syria. No, they're, they're very different, and they're very sympathetic uh, in many ways. I mean, you get to see uh, Hector's mother wailing for him from the walls after Achilles kills him in front of his parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are moments of pure lyricism in the Iliad, and I've tried to do that in prose as, as much as I can. And I think you can in 21st century do lyricism in prose just as well as poetry. But um, she describes his life in detail. There's by far the most moving moment of the book is where uh, Hector, his wife, and his young son um, meet for a little while on the walls of Troy, and she tells him, don't go out there. Don't go out there. You know what's going to happen. And he says, yeah, I, I know what 
it's going to happen. And he's looking at his wife knowing she'll be sold on an auction block, and he's looking at his little son knowing his son will be disemboweled as soon as the Greeks see him because you don't leave the sons alive. Um, and he still says, I've got to go out there. And the last line of the Iliad is very problematic, as they say in the academic biz. Um, it's something like, and thus was buried Hector, who, or rather, I think it's an adjective, thus they buried horse-taming Hector. And that's when you really get a sense that you're dealing with another culture because mm. the people who wrote this were good. They would not have wasted a random adjective mm -hmm. on the last line of the book. So it's not like, you know, and thus they buried Hector who once collected stamps. Mm -hmm. it, it, it cannot mean that. Mm -hmm. So this is one moment where you have to go back to the, what does horse mean in uh, ancient culture? It means, first of all, you're rich, you're usually well-born. All the words in a lot of uh, languages, uh, caballero, cavalier, all these things, cavaliere, they all mean horsemen. And horseman means gentleman. And, you know, look, the Indo-European kings used to mate with horses. Uh, it was a big thing in Ireland, in fact. And... Uh, Female horses, as the old joke goes. And, um, <laughs> well, the, I, I, so I guess, know, to be can, honest, I didn't know about that. I'm just sorry, just clearing my throat yeah. here. I didn't know uh, about yeah. that. Okay. Well, now you, you do. learn something new every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, or at least they claim to mate with mares. Uh, horses are worshipped in this text. Mm. Two out of three of Achilles' horses are immortal. There's a moment where, really fascinating moment where after um, Patroclus is killed, um, Zeus sort of leans out of the sky and says to the two horses uh, who are weeping for Patroclus, don't, I told you, don't love any of these mortals. They just die on you. It's sort of like what a, a parent would say to a kid about a hamster or something. And you get the, the sense that whoever wrote this was astonishingly broad-minded in ways that we can't even imagine. Like a god talking to a horse on the grounds that they're both immortal, whereas us human mortals are nothing but an unworthy pity object. It's really remarkable. So gods and horses, very close. The last line, that's the way they buried horse-taming Hector. But you cannot do that. You cannot just end the text saying um, that was the way they buried Horse taming Hector. Horse taming Hector has to mean, uh, you know, remember Hector was a good man. Um, so I just ended it. Uh, that was how they buried Hector, the best of men. Um, and that's one of the few places where I intentionally took liberties with the original. I mean, aside from ditching the meter, I, I tried to keep very close to this. But there are some cases where, you know, horse taming is just not going to do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I wanted to at least do a show about the book because, uh, you know, I know our subscribers and a lot of your fans have been waiting quite a long time for uh, for the Elliot to come out. You finished it. I want to say you finished it, I mean... Two years ago. It, two years ago. Yeah, it was two years ago because I remember, I remember you sending me chapters. And um, it was, uh, was it before we started... And you fin or no, you, you were finishing it was, just as we started the, the Radio Warner. Yeah. Yeah. Because I finished it um, in Greece in a teeny little um, hotel room with a bed that I think was stuffed with roofing nails in <laughs> Leptocaria. Which was, and you can see the, uh, the Olympic range from Leptocaria, so it oh, seemed cool. appropriate. Yeah. You wrote it fast, too, as I recall. I mean, you, you were yeah. – you, you, once you got on a roll, and that's when you know you – doing a book right, I think, is when yep. you're on a roll yep. like that. Like, it just starts... The, you can understand where people start, or where the ancient Greeks and others would think there is a muse because it's suddenly... Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like if you become really good at long-distance running, I, it's happened to me a few times when I was younger, and it. I remember you knew you were getting good at it because, some, like, by mile three, you, you stopped 
feeling any tiredness at all, a mile two or three, and you feel like it doesn't make a difference if you go five or 10 or 15 miles, it, you're, it's like you're walking. And I know like when riding going postal, like at some point it just got, it got easy. Um, it just yeah. came out because I knew I'd hit the right note on it or something. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, I mean, when you're going in at the correct angle, then uh, the rest is easy. Mm -hmm. God, I've never experienced that running though, but I, Catherine has. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. She's do, she does uh, marathons. Right. Yeah. Maybe she did. Yeah. Man. In fact, after after all that stuff, we moved down to Athens, and she uh, she tried the the Athens marathon, or as they say, the original. Um, that didn't go so well, but you know, uh, later she ran marathons much more successfully. But yeah, that that feeling came very strongly that um, this was uh, in the proper channel and and very easy to do. But for that matter. I believe in all kinds of things, depending on the time of day and, you know, my blood sugar levels. I mean, I, when I, I remember when I was desperate to get this job in New Zealand, I walked my dog in the, in the yard of the school where I'd gone as an elementary school kid. It was now defunct and everything was ruined. And I just remember praying to the moon that I would get this go this job. And I don't know why I prayed to the moon, but it just <laughs> seemed like the thing to do. I mean, I, I can imagine muses just as easily as that. Mm -hmm. All right. So anyway, thank you um, for, I don't know, for the great reading. And I, I just adore hey, this I'm, book. I'm and, a guest, aren't I? I know. <laughs> it is, it's kind of like I want to say, yeah, thanks. John, I don't want to take up more of your time. No, because um, <laughs> we're actually going to come back and do a w World of Wars, and we'll talk about the online Twitter shit show um, that's going on. Um, one thing, I, the last thing I just want to say is I, I do want to kind of keep coming back. I don't want to make this the only time we talk about the book. Like, I want to, I want to, uh, there's so many passages in it and there are going to be other appropriate times, I think, to bring out little parts of it. So I'm just going to like keep my, keep one of the copies here at Brendan's place for that okay. as well. Oh, thanks. Okay. <sighs> yeah, no, it's a great book. I, uh, I, I strongly recommend everyone listening, if you haven't got it yet, uh, buy the Warner uh, Iliad um, and try and push it too. Like some of our, some of your readers have done. I, it's, it's, I mean, it deserves to be out there. I, I saw one, uh, somebody on the Warner Facebook page saying that they went into the uh, a heart, you know, brick and mortar bookstore and, and asked for it and asked it to be ordered. And then I think it wound up on the, you know, on one of the bookshelves after that, um, after they got the book kind of excited. Yeah, I mean, so. that, the, the thing about, well, you know, you and I are, have both pretty much not moved in, in mainstream American literary circles uh, for a long time, if ever. So I, I don't know a lot of people who review books, but if you know anybody who reviews books um, and you can slip this to them, please do so. I mean, I, I wouldn't even mind a few pans. Pan the hell out of me. I once panned one of my own books. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm under another name, of course. But, uh, I'm all for that. That reminds me of something uh, Flan O'Brien did uh, the, the with the what was it the McCruskin? He had so he came up with a fake invented name, and he wrote some sort of really priggish letter to the editor to whatever the main newspaper in Dublin was at the time, maybe the Irish Times. Um, and they published it. And then he wrote under a different pseudonym attacking that other person's letter like yeah. the next week. And then he created these different characters. They all started fighting with each other. And no one knew that it was him, including, yeah. I don't think, the editors. And no, I, that, I think that was Kruskin Lawn. Kruskin and, Lawn, uh, yeah. And the name was Miles McGuffley. Right, right. Yeah. And event, uh, that's how he got hired as a columnist, too, I think, when he finally kind of revealed himself. It was, it was yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. 